like a child. Yeah. Hi, folks. I'm Marcy Timmerman, Executive Director of Mental Health America of Kentucky. We are your hosts today. I'll be the technical advisor as well. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat to me directly or publicly. Um, also, feel free to ask questions in the chat. We will do our best to make sure that they are answered as we go um, or possibly at the end, depending on Jan's ability at the moment. So um, wanted to thank Dr. Reverend Dr. Jan Cottrell for coming to uh, present today for Labyrinths for Mental Wellness. Reverend Dr. Jan has a Doctor of Ministry from the University of the South. She is Chaplain and Licensed Pastoral Council Counselor at the Center for Relationships in Nicholasville. She has done a Chaplaincy Fellowship at the Lexington VA Medical Center. Uh, she has for 21 years, she served as the rector of the Episcopal Church of the Resurrection, um, and she was also an assistant rector at the St. Michael of the Archangel Church in Lexington. So she's been around the Lexington area for a long time, but um, all that said, I'll pass it over to you. All righty. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I really appreciate Marcy being invited to do this. The uh, labyrinth is um, really an important part of my own mental well-being, and I've just become incredibly interested in how the labyrinth um, in initiates and integrates the imagination into the human psyche and also how the labyrinth um, accesses the unconscious. And we'll talk about that. I wanna tell a couple of stories first. Um, one, how I got interested, I mean, um, I was doing actually a mental health fellowship after the residency at the VA, which is a, another year of just focus on mental health. And um, along came, you know, we were doing also continuing education and that kind of stuff. And um, my supervisor said I was required to take this three day over the weekend. Yep. Um, course, a Friday, Saturday and Sunday on the labyrinth and I'm thinking, hey, I'm an Episcopalian. I know about labyrinths, I walk in circles. But boy, that humbled me because I had so much to learn and it changed my life, it changed my practice with all different ages. And um, it started there at, at the Veterans Hospital. And what we had a, um, a portable labyrinth, a really what I call an ugly plastic labyrinth we laid on the floor. And when we would put it out for groups and individuals, we tried to pretty it up by putting um, artificial candles around it and soft music and da da da. Um, and there was a, a move to get a larger outdoor labyrinth, but people who are interested in the labyrinth and investing in them are pretty limited. And I get that. Um, well, we took a group out to Versailles to what I mentioned to you, Marcy, is the most beautiful labyrinth, in my opinion, in the world. And I've, I've traveled some. And if, if you still have that link, stick it up there at some point. It's a labyrinth in Versailles that um, was created by wounded warriors. And we take a busload, a group from our substance abuse group or PTSD or whatever. Well, it was all, it's handicap accessible. And, and as much as it can be, it was for the amputees and stuff. We get back from that trip and I was later visiting in, in the, uh, with this amputee and talking about the labyrinth. And he said to me something that also changed how I think about life and the labyrinth. Because the labyrinth really is the archetypal image for our life's journey. We're not gonna do this today, but if you're not familiar with the hero's journey, it ties really well into the symbolic archetypical nature of the labyrinth. Um, but he's, we're sitting there talking and I, this was a amputee, by the way, who I walked the journey of him having to make the choice to have his legs removed. So there was a lot of relationship there and feeling. And he said to me, you know, Jan, this hospital is my labyrinth. And I let that sink in. And I thought about the moments and the hours and the days and the months that I walked 
the labyrinth of that hospital where history is all over the building. And I began to use that building also as a labyrinth and every turn to imagine what is turning in my life or what is turning in the veteran's life. The turns of the labyrinth are, are beautiful points and sim symbols of when we can choose to turn. So that story um, matters to me and, and how I've carried that on into my life and into my practice is encouraging patients and clients. And I like to use the word patient because it implies healing and wholeness. And the symbol of the, the labyrinth, the round circle is a sign of wholeness. And so, but finding labyrinths when you don't have access to a formal labyrinth um, is really important. For instance, I encourage people who have a dog. Um, I encourage people to have dogs, by the way. Um, that's another whole, that's another webinar, <laughs> dogs and healing. Um, but the labyrinth, um, you can create a journey with, by, say for instance, you take your dog for a walk. Tell me about that journey and where you go and see if you can find in your neighborhood a, a going place and a returning place with turns. And as you go, take that grief, that anger, that whatever you're dealing with, that loneliness, that lostness, that uh, isolation, take it with you. Just don't take everything in your backpack at once. Just take one thing and take, take something of beauty too. Um, that's uh, feeding that wolf of beauty. That will come back. So choose something and walk it out. Um, in the labyrinth, what I learned during the labyrinth training, which was also powerful, um, was what um, Turning Point consultants did with us was this thing called the honor walk. And we, um, it was designed for veterans, but it can be applied to many different things. So let me tell you about the honor walk and then maybe you can imagine um, what that might look like in your practice, your ministry, your life. And I'll say this, if, if you don't use a labyrinth, maybe part of this webinar, you can adopt the notion of start using it because if you're gonna recommend it to patients and clients, it's good to have some familiarity with it um, and to play with it a little bit. And, and play, play with it is really important term. I'll come back to that, but the honor walk, um, what we did is we set up the little portable, I think it was a five circuit labyrinth that we set up um, and um, put some candles around it music. And we would ask the veterans, we'd give them like a, um, what do you, a uh, little five by, oh, those little cards, um, like recipe cards, that's not, <laughs> um, and to write the name of a battle buddy on the card, nothing else, just the name. And I talk to them about how to not think about anything going in to the labyrinth. Um, don't think about anything, just hold the card. Or if they didn't have a, they all had battle buddies that had died, had limbs blown off or some horrible, frightening, traumatic loss. Um, but I also think like holding, like a rock that carries the name or something of significance that they can feel the weight of the grief, the weight of the loss. But in that case, we used a little card. They wrote the name on and um, they began the journey in one at a time, music going, candles. And I asked them when they got done to just gather quietly around the side. In the center of the labyrinth was a bowl of water and some of our veterans would um, self-identify as Christian or whatever tribe they um, felt part of or none at all. It didn't matter. The labyrinth belongs to the world. It belongs to the planet. It belongs to everyone. Um, but, and I think people who self-identify in whatever way, they can find their way with that. So anyway, they, they would walk if, I'm telling you, I can't think of a time when this didn't happen. 
walking the name in, just emptying themselves. And, along, and I would just be observing, although I've done it many times, along about the second circuit, I would start to see emotion in their body. And I'd ask, they were asked to put the name down if they were able to in the center and reverence it in whatever way was their custom. The water was there for those that um, self, maybe holy water, whatever to touch the water and to feel a connection to the water of the earth, the water of their life, the, the purity of that. And then to slowly walk out if they're able without the burden of the loss and just allow it to happen. So here's, here is the stories that, that I, um, this is a, a story, it's someone's story. Um, but this is consistent with what happens when this is done, when this is embraced. Person walks in carrying the battle buddy sad, um, survivor's guilt. They still have their legs and arms. They still have, they might even still have their marriage. But emptying themselves and they put the name down and then we'd gather at the end and tell me about what happened. And they'd share it in group if they were able. I remembered, here, here's what would happen. I remembered something about Susan Smith or whoever, Joey, or whoever the person was, I remembered something that I had forgotten, something that had brought our relationship great joy. And that came up out of their unconscious. It was down there, but it was so buried by the trauma. So, you know, it, it taps into those unconscious places in our psyche that are still there. And you can, you can use that honor walk with lots of circumstances. Um, for instance, <laughs> um, James Hollis, a great, uh, one of my favorite Jungian authors, he's a Jungian analyst and I think he lives in Ch Washington DC now, I've written a lot of books, but he has a saying that my husband has told me he's gonna put it on my gravestone. <laughs> Um, because I say it all the time. It's called, it's not about what it's about. And just so I'll give you an example. This doesn't have anything to do with the labyrinth, but it's an example people can understand. And it's one that I experience. It's not about what it's about. I'm going into Kroger's one day here in Lexington, freezing, frigid, cold day. I'm in a hurry going in to get my bread and milk and there's two ladies out of their cars and their cars are parked trying to get in the same parking spot and i got i just wanted to go in not get involved but i thought mm, that's not about that parking spot they were screaming at the top of their lungs and all i said was is everybody all right And it, it was like the noise. And one looked at me at this morning. And I thought, oh, that's what this is about. Your grief, your anger, being projected, poor, trying to get a parking spot. Um, my point in saying that, or why we do what we do. And to, to take into the labyrinth walk, I wonder why I lost it with my child this morning. I wonder why I screamed at my spouse when he poured too much cream in my coffee, you know, and just take one incident in. Have you got the sound? Everything okay? Okay, okay, good. Um, so, so take some notes and think about that. And let me, let me, I've got some notes too. I want to just share um, just in case you're here today and you weren't clear what a labyrinth is. Um, it's like I said, it belongs to everybody. It's an ancient 
um, contemplative tool. Um, it's been in existence for thousands of years and the twists and turns of it are, um, you know, the going from the outer world to our inner world. And, um, and when, when children see it, they say, it's a maze, it's a maze. And, um, and I'll say, no, it's amazing. <laughs> and um, so, and let them, but I, I, a side note is I'm extremely interested right now in children in the labyrinth. Cause I've, since I've made one lately, I've been watching a lot of children during COVID um, come down, they'll come ring my doorbell and say, you put the labyrinth out and, and I just let them do their thing on it. And then we'll talk about that. But So what about um, people say, well, how should I walk the labyrinth? Um, well, after watching the children skip, run, twirl, somersault, um, <laughs> you know, all kinds of, I, I don't know if there is one way, but my advice and counsel and suggestion is to find your way, to find your way, to find and um, how I have done that um, so that I can help others find their way is um, by, by, by certainly walking them and doing things like I mentioned with the honor walk with different parts of me. I mean, heavens to Betsy, if we're not working on ourselves, folks, we're not going to be any help to anybody else. So um, just it's a good way to work on self too. Um, and so I um, have found that um, by walking it um, and by making labyrinths, um, I'm going to show you in just a minute how to just draw a quick three circuit labyrinth. Um, and then, frankly, because people know I am very interested in a labyrinth, I get a lot of labyrinth gifts, which is really nice. I've got little, I've got, I'll show, show you a few of those. But um, the first time I made a labyrinth that mattered to me, um, even though it's been several years since I did that training, was um, last Ash Wednesday, um, COVID, when, you know, we're kind of, just I really thought all this would be over right now, as we all did about, you know, February and March, we thought the kids will be back in school soon, you know, whatever. Well, so I start this labyrinth on my dining room table. I laid out a cloth, um, knowing we probably wouldn't be having people over. Uh, I laid out a pretty cloth and I, I do like, um, I don't have it right here. I like rocks a lot. Um, and a lot of people like rocks. So I might go somewhere and have special rocks. A lot of times I don't remember where I got them from when I put them in the pile, but I know it was special. It's kind of like that special place. I put something in the house and then lose it for six months. We've all done that, haven't we? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I know, we'll find it. Um, but what happened with that lemon? So I had a bunch of rocks I had collected from various places I'd gone. And I'd also had made some labyrinths in other countries when I'm I also am a teacher for Living Waters for the World. So we go all over the planet and I like to do labyrinths with the people in the villages because rocks are available and it's fun. But when I made one for me, instead of anybody else, it was different. I chose rocks. They were just little, they fit on your dining room table. I was gonna make like a five circuit Crete labyrinth. Um, and you can go, anybody can go online and get pictures of all these. You could um, email me and I'll send you whatever, but an hour is not enough time to talk about labyrinth. But um, anyway, um, but what happened making that labyrinth this year was every rock, I began to think of it as um, someone who had COVID, someone who had died of COVID, a healthcare worker that I knew, um, my own spouse who's insulin dependent, who may never, he's an eye doctor, examine another pair of eyes again. You know, the griefs, it became this journey of putting the rocks down and really putting them down. I mean, putting them down and, and, and looking at them and then walking it in, like I met, pretended my hand was like a spider, just, I like spiders, I'm, you know, <laughs> and walking it in 
and every rock became a symbol of what we're going, you know, like rocks that teachers who weren't teaching in the classroom, children, home, every, there's, I could have made a, the, a huge labyrinth would have covered my whole first floor of my house for all that's going on, even then. So the, I didn't expect that to happen. I was just gonna make a pretty labyrinth to decorate our house. That'd be nice. But it became this um, letting go of things I didn't even know I was holding on to. And so throughout then Lent this year, I left that on the table. And then my husband started helping me a little bit more with it, especially when I was crying over it. You all right, honey? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> um, we started adding things to the table that, that mattered to the story of COVID. Um, and some of them were things like co the blessings of COVID have been, we have spent more time in the original monastery, the earth, than we have ever been afforded. So we started adding things like um, branches and um, a bowl of water and, you know, just things. And it, it was hard for me to take that apart. Why I did, I didn't, I took it apart. This is really confession time. You know, Episcopalians, we end our seasons. Right, we do. It's part of the cycle, yes. I know. So I end, I, I ended it, but then I, but anyway, but in for in in the spirit of this um, webinar, I made a little one last night just to show you what I'm talking about with a different set of rocks. Um, but let me see if you can see this. I'm moving my computer. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. Looks good. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's just a little Crete labyrinth, and. If you look at it, it's got, last night I was just putting some things that were special. I've got a little couple pieces of jewelry that um, people get, you know, gave me. And then this, can you see the rocks I, that are painted? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, and then there's my tr the tree that we had on the Lenten one. There's a finger labyrinth and so there's some seashells. And then I have the symbol of balance there and just things that matter to you, not to me, but when, if you make one and... I would invite you to consider and see what happens, make one. But like for instance, um, um, my clients have actually done this and they started me on, I, I'm not that creative, but um, painting, finding rocks that paint an event. Now this is mine. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. It's a little, okay. okay. Um, this is a silly story, but it wasn't silly to me. Um, and that was um, last spring I was playing golf and I love animals. I love creation. I can never hardly hit even the hole or the green, but I hit a robin and the robin fell to the ground. And I was just heartbroken. And someone came out who saw me crying on the golf course and, and said, let me help you. He got a post hole digger and we turned the animal over to the earth. And um, I came home and um, worked on my table labyrinth a little more. And then I painted this Robin to just let that Robin be free from my soul. Um, painted a, 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 a after a, a Jewish friend of ours that my dog and I used to visit died um, during COVID and I painted, you know, so taking the walking of the labyrinth into your life, I think is really important and critical and with your clients and patients to help them find ways to take an image and a symbol that matters to them and to make that tangible and I think when we do that, we start putting down some of the other images and symbols that we see throughout our days. You know, the negativity, the violence. Think of all the things we see on TV, on screens. And I mean, just think of the, uh, the symbols that are constantly bombarding us and to find, to make and to find signs and symbols of health and healing through walking. 
And it's not just simply walking, it's kind of meditative walking, right? So a little bit of both. It's, it's both. And um, I know I have some patients who self-identify as Christian and they have walked it in just saying the Lord's Prayer, saying the 23rd Psalm, just in a, as a mantra um, to find, and that's really good for the soul too. So finding what works. So don't give up and don't let them give up if they think they have to do it some right way. Um, one of the things I've seen recently, as I was telling you, Marcy, with the children, um, I laid out the, um, I, oh, I, I'm, oh, during COVID, um, I bought a 20 by 20 drop cloth from Amazon, $100. And I, oh no, that's my child. Sorry. Could you hear that? That That's my, my daughter. That's, okay. that, that's her ring. <laughs> that's funny. Um, I'll have those moments. <laughs> the timing's hilarious. Um, so chill, what was I saying? Oh, so early in COVID, I bought a 20 by 20 drop cloth. And you, you, anybody can go online and say how to create a labyrinth. You know, you can pencil it out. And that's what I did. I penciled it out according to some online thing and um, got some acrylic paints. I painted in the four corners, the Native American four directions because I love... Native American spirituality. And I thought that might, here we are. The labyrinth, this is, I'm gonna say should, which I don't usually like to say should, but I think the labyrinth should be a connection to the earth. We are creatures of the earth. And when, when you're able to walk one outside, to feel your feet on the earth, even if it's a cloth you have to walk on, it connects you to something so much bigger than ourselves. So I, I did that, the Native American images, and my husband helped me with that because he's a much better painter than I am. But then I just took green wall paint. Oh, there it is, yeah. Um, yeah, that's in my driveway in the backyard. And it took weeks to do that. Um, what happened at first is that um, I, I designed it and um, again, Ken, my husband helped me with it. And I started painting it out there thinking like so many things, oh, this is gonna be easy. Um, but what happened is creating it got into my psyche and my soul. And I, I dreamt about it. I had to move it into the garage because my knees were actually bleeding. <laughs> um, so I got some pads for my knees, moved it into the garage and worked on it for weeks, just a little bit at a time and thought about the turns and imagined the turns of my life and, um, and just took all that into the center. And, and certainly it was wonderful for my already great marriage because we were working on it together. And, um, and the funny thing is a drop cloth you think is not gonna go through because it's a drop cloth. We now have a green labyrinth in the garage floor. <laughs> and the kids and they would love that well so anyway on, on nice days we put it out and and just put it out to see what happens to see who shows up and I've asked the neighborhood we have a big neighborhood Facebook site I said if you see the labyrinth out um you're welcome to join if there's more than two or three people we you know just keep it safe right now wear a mask take your shoes off wear your slippers whatever um but children on it have taught me something. They've taught me something about the labyrinth can reignite and help us re-embrace our imagination. I've watched children become helicopters. They really do. They are helicopters on the labyrinth. And I just think, oh, they are helicopters. They're not children right now. We lose our imaginations as we get older because everything is so rigid and it's right or wrong. But allow, you know, if working with patients and clients, ask them about when, in the, when, how far back can you remember when you were in your very essence, when you were just 
could be anything and we're really there. And a lot of times it's like three, four and five. Um, that's still in us and it's still important and it's healing. Um, quick personal story. <laughs> um, I had my three and a half year old grandson. He loves the labyrinth. Can you imagine when he's my age? That will always have been part of his life. Loves it. And we have a, a advent lighted one on the front lawn, but that's another whole story. Well, this is imagination at its finest. I took him to feed the ducks over behind Kroger's here in Lexington and he loves, he calls them the quack quacks. And we went one day and there was 17 of them. And then the next day there was only a couple and he was fed them and he said, well, where are they? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe they're getting ready for Christmas. And he said, oh, and I said, do you think Santa comes to see the quack quacks and Connor said well the quack quack Santa does <laughs> that's adorable <laughs> I mean and I said I think you're right just like the teddy bear Santa comes to the teddy bears you know yep, and he just believed that with all his mind and heart and I thought that's what we lose we lose the ability to touch that powerful force I think the labyrinth can do that. I've seen it happen with children. And I feel like it happens when people make them and walk them. And, um, and that's what, you know, there's a place called the way of transformation in the labyrinth. And that's, that's what we're looking for. And I, it's, it's one of our tools as mental health providers too, that um, we can actually try you know, sometimes if, if you send a client to a prescriber as, as a, for me, that's a last resort because we want to try as many other modalities as possible. Um, but I can't experiment myself with medicine, <laughs> see if it works. But I can, we can get to know the labyrinth. We can, you know, there's certainly there are other modalities too, but it's, 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 it's a, a very organic experience and it takes a little while get in the habit of it. It's like the discipline of walking the labyrinth. It's like the discipline of journaling, the discipline of doing any of our inner stuff. Um, how are we doing on time? What are we doing? Doing oh, great. We're, we're, we're very good. Let me see. Um, Renee Mullins added in there that they use rocks in their bereavement and grief work with bereaved hmm. children. The rocks are called memory stones. They provide oh, a Using art, they create a memory jar and keep their own space to go to and remember. So, oh, I love that. Yeah. It was beautiful and works right along with your memory stones that you've got as part of your labyrinth. So. Yeah, I love that. Thanks, Renee. Uh, that's really good. I can't, when I, I'm, I see the chat, but I'm trying not to read the chat while I'm talking. But um, yeah. <laughs> let me see if we can do this. Um, I'll turn this and I'll, I'll show you real quick how, if I can, how. Um, that's good. You can see the little, the pad. I, don't, I can move it up closer. I need to do that. I need to move it just a little closer, especially if folks are using a smaller screen. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So this is just going to be a little three circuit labyrinth. Again, you can go online, but making it can be a, a holy experience again. And by holy, I mean, I mean, for me, it has its own meaning but it's a word that means set aside to, for specialness. And you know, it's a, it's a beautiful word. So you just draw a little X and four little dots. And after you do it a couple of times, you'll kind of know where you want to put your dots to get it right. And, um, and then okay, you see where this used to be? I took my marker and just touched this first dot on the right. And then I went over here to this dot, to one dot, two dot, three dot, four dot. And then I'm gonna to go to this arm, let me make that out. And then here, there's supposed to be this dot. And then take, go over to this dot. So the person can take their whatever they're going to go in with. They could even be like breadcrumbs. I love using breadcrumbs because they do get eaten by birds. Not right here, but 
you just can go in and this you know a dot is your one of your turns make your turn and end up in the center easy okay yeah. easier uh, than it looks at first huh what? <laughs> easier yeah. than it looks at first right 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 and you're kind of always going from um left to right see that's left to right i did uh left to right 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 uh, and again that that is a simple labyrinth but a good place to start especially for a table labyrinth and for in this case a poster board but there i keep i keep this in my office um this is something um actually that my uh, one of my kids gave me and it's a chartreuse labyrinth that has it's in, I, that's a favorite one although it takes takes some time to work it, but I, I like it because it's based on the lunar cycle. Um, there's 28 turns. There's 28 days in the lunar cycle. And that again, creates, it connects us to the universe. And these are not concepts that every one of our patients or clients will be familiar with, but, you know, trying to see you know we try to meet our patients and clients where they are and go from there rather than I'm, <laughs> this would not be the first stuff i would say unless they said to me i oh, i love the labyrinth i really need some help disciplining myself you know yes but helping them discover it and and its power and um and more importantly, to discover what is under the tip of the iceberg of our consciousness. Um, I always joke because there's so much, like we all, we're sitting here right now, we're all the sum of our biographies. You know, we're right, well, let me do this. I hadn't planned to do this, but I'm, I took a special um, class in seminary called Seat of the Pants. Um, <laughs> it was a good class. I did well in it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we are all right here on Zoom. That's all of us. We're right here in this moment in history. Historical day, by the way. But for all of us, like the sum of my, I'm the sum of my biography. I've had some twists and turns and some trauma and stuff. And here I am at this webinar with you. Underneath that is all of my stuff, a lot of good stuff. Um, a lot of stuff I can't remember unless I work on it. Um, like for instance, I know I had a second grade teacher. Can I remember her name right now? No. <laughs> Did I love her? Yes. Um, so if I really wanna go back and retrieve that, actually I could use the labyrinth to do that. I haven't worked on that because it hasn't been all that important to me but sometimes just getting back under that tip of the iceberg uh, of our biographies it's all down there and to go back um whoa like get one of your clients who have been traumatized to go back there and look at their biography and what they've done since then and to take that trauma to the labyrinth again and again and again yeah and um one of the things that i find really powerful um in terms of trauma work and i made up this term myself okay so this is as far as i know uh, and the term I call it insidious trauma. Trauma that the culture doesn't really call trauma, but it was very traumatic and over a period of time that happened and maybe caused by a group of people or um, for instance, say the young female clergy person who goes to an almost all male seminary and get stalked by a professor, someone who would read her ordination exams 
she's married, he's married. And it goes on for months and months and months. Touches her hands, tells her she's beautiful, um, but doesn't rape her, but rapes her emotionally. And everywhere she goes, she's scared. Even she tells her husband and her husband says, he's just a nice guy, you know, a good old boy. And it, she's not believed by anybody, but it's, it is traumatic. And the, the betrayal, the isolation, the fear, you know, all of that, you know what I'm talking about, but that's called insidious trauma. It never gets named by the culture. And that's why sometimes people bring stuff to us in the sacred space of our offices and they're almost embarrassed to say it bothered them. It's been so many years. We know. We know it doesn't go away if you don't deal with it, right? Right, so, right. Yep. And the so, lab is a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. And again, if you can get to one outdoors and um, there's one in Danville. Um, I'll try to put up, I had um, some local ones on what, you can Google the Labyrinth Society is such a great resource um, to, to go to. Veritas is another great resource. Um, they've got Facebook pages and you can join them. And it's kind of fun because people post things of labyrinths they're making and you feel, you know, it's really formative and educational. So if you're interested, you know, just like those things on Facebook and you'll see Labyrinth News and Labyrinth. Um, I know Veritas just had a, um, a Zoom training um, that I would love to have taken, but you know, also you have to balance if you have the, the money and the time to really benefit. But, um, and Zooming Labyrinths, like here we are. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be your best way to, to learn. Huh? I know, yeah. I know. But it's a great thing to start at home, like you said. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. But again, um, engage, embrace it yourself and your family and uh, and and clients and children. Um, and, and I'm trying to take notes right now. Um, I'm not. I love to write, but I don't know if I'll ever publish a book because there's there's so many books. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like, but I am interested in how the labyrinth um, engages imagination in children and adults and, and why that's important. And I can't answer all those questions today, but I'm interested. And if you ever have anything to add to that, let me know. Sounds good. Um, Are there any questions from those of you participating? You can either unmute or you can drop them in the chat. Dan, have you ever done, do you do a finger, like a finger labyrinth? Is that what the wooden one was that you have used? This is, this is Renee Mullins, by the way. I know Renee. <laughs> um, uh, like, you know, so like using in like a um, grief counseling session, like using it and use it with your fingers. So what would you recommend to, to start with that? How, how would you particularly start about using that with someone or introducing it to them? Um, I, I might show them a Chartres labyrinth but I think that's a lot to start with, even though you can, I mean, I think I, there's so many beautiful things and even tell them a little bit about the history of it and um, the number of turns, but to start then small where they okay. are, just a, a little three circuit one that they could draw or show them. And then if you know them well enough, you could help them like there's little pebbles that I actually made my labyrinth with can be used as a, a path into the center they could they could put a, a path down or if it's just a paper labyrinth that you've drawn they could draw dots of um, the, the, the <laughs> this was really a fun story i had a, a large paper one that i had made with one of my relatives my relatives are my guinea pigs I love them um and i a niece wanted to do it and i told her to put the breadcrumbs down that i had made and um, <laughs> and talk to me while she was putting them down um, and tell me about her journey through COVID. And well, on the way out, she ate them all. Isn't that great? I didn't tell her to, what to do with them. I thought she'd put them aside. Um, forgot to ask her to wash her hands, but well. But, you know, just kind of see where it goes especially with the people you're working with, 
gosh, the memories, the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is Zara. Hi, uh, Zara. Hello, good to so see good you. to see you. One of my trainers. I was hor I just horrified to learn it that you had to take a weekend off. I didn't know that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, one of the a group um, of uh, mental health professionals in Alabama uses this constantly for group work, and I think it's I think it would be, uh, we've used it for um, domestic abuse uh, as group work, and it's very powerful to do with a group. Um, I don't know if your clients patients have do group work. But um, it's a way for them to support each other and to tell stories. One of the practitioners um, has maybe got, gets everyone together for three or four sessions, first of all, to tell stories to each other. And then they all go out and walk the labyrinth. Many ways to do this. But I'm just saying don't dismiss group work because it is important. Thanks. Well, Zara, thank you so much for being here. This woman is really the expert and you're, you're so right about group work. The feeling of community is so powerful when it is used with a group that already has some connection. Um, yeah, right now, of course, we're not, not many of us are doing any group work, but they might be in hospital settings. And uh, I know I've talked to some people at our local VA and they're doing some group work, very small groups, but it, the labyrinth also, it lends itself to small groups because you can be six feet apart and, you know, and to sit six feet apart outside the labyrinth and then to talk about what, hap what happened. You know, I, thank you. That's excellent. By the way, uh, I don't have it here in front of me, but Zara has a wonderful, let me see if I have it, book you published about the labyrinth. I don't have, what's it? I forgot the name of it. I, it's so wonderful. It's uh, Labyrinths, Journeys of Healing, Stories of Grace. Yes. Oh, it's, it is a fine resource. And um, yes, thank you for putting those words to paper. Thank you. Well, everything that we learned, we learned from our clients from, and particularly from yep. the children. The children were the people who taught us. Yep. So. I, I, I'm learning that right now. And COVID's a great time for us all to learn that lesson and 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 reintroduce ourselves to the child within ourselves. Um, I've asked people to um, bring a picture of themselves when they were in their essence to the office, and it's usually one of those school pictures that you know, just a face headshot that was taken in school and you're usually smiling and, you know, you fit, you put on a special outfit that mom or dad wanted you to wear and your hair's combed and, but there's something in the face that's so pure. Tell me about that time. Let's go into the labyrinth and get that out. So, yeah, there, there's just so much. There is one of the reasons I asked you to come on um, and speak about this was that I've seen the one that you put out for your neighbors. And I just thought it was interesting how you've basically built a community in your own labyrinth um, in, you know, your front yard, your backyard, <laughs> wherever yeah. it might be. Yeah. And uh, I'd be glad to explain more precisely to someone to be interested how that came to be because um, I thought I was making it for my use in clinical work, and I will when we ever get back, that, but making it was very cathartic and powerful. And, um, and neighbors would come by, because um, everybody's out walking their dogs, and I, I, we can see the back of my house if you're walking from us, and they'd see somebody on their knees painting with green, and they'd come, what are you doing? And of course, a lot of people were not familiar neighbors with it, and I get that. Um, so, um, but I, I love helping people. I my opinion is, if you want a labyrinth, you should have one. I love it. That's great. Any other last minute questions, folks? As we are getting to the end of the hour, I'm just looking to see. I had some notes. If anything else I needed to add? Mm -hmm. Yep. See if you skipped it. Um, 
Jan, I will be in touch with you like when we are back in person, because we do, you know, with, with hospice, we do a lot of spouse loss groups. And Zara was saying about group work, we've used the labyrinth, the one in Versailles with our children in a camp we've done there, but but we've not used one for like spouse loss or parent loss. So I might be in touch with you and, and perhaps maybe you could help facilitate one of those. And um, we could we could talk as we're getting over get, you know, in person again. But thank you. I've got to hop off here. Appreciate it today. All right. Thanks, Renee. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks, Renee. All right. And just again, I, I want to emphasize the the I think is the, the the metaphor and the archetypal nature of it is life's journey. Um, so thank you all for attending. And um, again, I, I'm happy you private message me. I'll be glad to talk more with you about it. We can talk on the phone or talk on Zoom or talk on FaceTime. Mm -hmm. And, and I, when I send out the link, I'll make sure I send out your contact information. So thank you very much, Reverend Dr. Cottrell. Thank you for everything you said. And folks, if you need any other, ever have any questions or need anything from us, we're at mhaky at mhaky.org. Oh, one more thing. Uh -huh. Did I put the link up for the app? You did not. Let's take okay. that. Let me, do, let me do that real quick because mm -hmm. that's a really, that's a good thing for our patients. And I, it's, it, it lights up as you walk through it. It's a, a Chartres. I'm, a, I'm trying to get it here. It's at labyrinthjourney.app. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. But let me see if I can, got it. Hold on. Oh, hold on. Give me two seconds. Uh, Copy that. Let me go over here. I meant to put that up first, but let's do it. I found it. Oh, you did? Okay. I can stick it up there. There we go. All right. Got it. What oh, good. Awesome resource good. that is. <laughs> yeah, it's nice on your phone. You could just be waiting for somebody and or give it to your clients. And it, when you put your finger on it, it a little light goes on. There's a, There's music. You can turn the sound on or off. And, um, you know, some people like silence and some people that helps them to get, it's like a sound machine, but it's much prettier. So, all right. That's awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you Marcy. Again. Thank you, everyone. And we, everybody take good care of yourselves and each other. And God bless. Yes, Hugs. Thank you. All right. <laughs>